Stanford University. I have a very broad and probably uh, too long talk. So I will talk very fast at certain points in time because I was told to leave time for questions. That way I can just beg questions at the end. Um, you know, um, there's a lot of anecdotes and things I can, I can mention and I probably will and, and I won't talk about United Technologies in the beginning. This is not an ad for United Technologies, but I'll, I'll sort of mention us in the, in, the, in the middle somewhere in context. Um, but there's a couple things I want to try to do. I want to take a pretty broad view about where building energy efficiency is. And I call it a systems approach. Um, I am sort of a systems person from a very parochial perspective, controls. Um, and I want to slice this systems aspect in a couple of different ways. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the market, at least as I see it, a little bit about some of the regulatory issues, and then a little bit about technology and a little bit at the end about where technology could go sometime in the future, tomorrow or next year or the year after. So um, this is not uh, at all my talk, and I, I did this this morning, and I probably could add another 20 names to this. Um, but uh, there are a number of people who, whose work this really is that I'm representing. Um, and I wanted to give some, some credit, um, as credit to do. Uh, individually, I could call out names, but I'll just go through the talk. So you know, here's what I want to say. I'll say it, and then say it at the end, at the end and then sort of take questions and see if I've gotten anything across. So, um, you know, one point is that uh, energy efficient buildings are, are really not new. And you can pick your baseline. I wrote down here ASHRAE 90.1. This is sort of a United States kind of lecture, but we could have uh, Chinese standards or other standards. And achieving 50 to 80% is possible. And proof points exist in all climates, all sizes, all usages, all everything. And I'll show that to you. And there's a design approach to this um, that historically has been called climate responsive or climate adaptive design um, that people knew about hundreds of years ago and maybe 20 years ago and then seemingly have forgotten recently. Um, but there's a few caveats to this. Uh, the market conditions here are not that great for delivering these buildings. And there are some market and also technology issues associated with how these buildings are delivered. So one thing I'll say later on the third bullet here is in some sense, buildings as designed, as constructed, and operated are orthogonal. And so the fact that you can do these kinds of buildings is different from being able to do them at a cost and time effective manner. So there's, there's something going on here. And then there's some issues about research and development that we'll get into about, about productivity and risk and operations. Um, so getting this done efficiently and getting this done at a level of risk that people can invest in and then be, being able to address um, the continuing operation of buildings. Um, I'll, I'll go into it in a little bit more detail. Okay, so four things that I want to cover. Um, I have now 38 minutes, so I will sprint through this material. Okay, so if you haven't seen this slide, it's a sort of famous DOE slide, um, especially this bottom piece here. And um, it basically says that uh, buildings use a lot of energy, both commercial and residential. So if you looked at this, about 40% total, um, about 18% of that is commercial office space. Um, and it uses um, you know, three quarters of the electricity in the United States. And if you break this down, there are three or four, depending on how you count, major chunks of this. Um, there's the industrial sector, which is manufacturing more or less. There's transportation, automotive mainly, and there's buildings which breaks down into commercial and uh, residential. And then you can break down in terms of the, the heavy hitters here. Um, you have in a commercial building lights, heating and cooling, which is your big hitters. And on the far side, um, it's a little bit of an, a lot of my charts are eye charts, but energy intensity is increasing. And you know, what is energy intensity? It's kilowatt hours per square meter. Um, and you know, a lot of this, if you want to correlate this in your own head, where is this occurring? The most energy intensive buildings in the United States are big box stores that have supermarkets associated with them. So uh, HVAC slash R plus lighting, they consume enormous amounts of energy. Um, so here's a wedge picture. And this is now in emissions. So this is gigatons of CO2, not energy consumption, but we could convert. And what this basically lays out is a, is a prediction of how energy is going to evolve, or energy consumption is going to evolve from business as usual to uh, blue sky kinds of predictions. And 
it breaks down sort of this in terms of these four areas. And so we got power generation, uh, mainly coal plants now contributing to uh, emissions. And in the earlier one, you know, power generation in buildings sort of fits together. There's a chunk of this that we could actually uh, detail out more precisely. But the point about this chart is that if you want to impact energy consumption in the short to medium term, the only thing to do is buildings. Because industry and transport, you have to replace a whole generation of equipment. Power generation equipment, automotive, and you, you drive down sort of the, the road here, how many old cars do you see? You can't do this overnight. Uh, Stephen Chu looks at a chart like this uh, when he was not only at LBNL but the Department of Energy and says not only are buildings low-hanging fruit but it's rotten and it's lying on the ground. Okay, so this is the comment that you have to address buildings. So parochially, I'll address buildings. Uh, a little bit about other places and we could have a lot about this. So to highlight some of the thinking in Europe, um, there's this notion of net zero energy buildings which a working definition here is you know 80% of uh, energy reduction and then maybe 20% from renewables. And so you're beginning to see both European Union as well as member state regulations that are beginning to mandate net zero energy buildings. And so uh, the regulatory landscape is being set differently. Um, here we're having trouble with our um, energy policy, but it's important to realize this is, this is a global problem. Okay, so where are we in terms of low energy buildings? So this is a system, uh, primary source on the y-axis, uh, kilowatt hours per square meter per year. And these are actual buildings, um, most of them, uh, past the US and Japan average. So if you break this down, which I'm not gonna do here in the interest of time, but if you looked at this, uh, the US average, including plug loads, is over 600 kilowatt hours per square meter per year. And then you look down here at three German buildings or four German buildings. Uh, this is in Stuttgart, Bonn, Stuttgart, Frankfurt. Uh, you're beginning to see well below 100 kilowatt hours per square meter per year. So this is the landscape. These are the targets, if you will. And this is current usage. OK, what's in these buildings? Or at least a little bit more detail. And when I said earlier, um, these buildings exist. I'll spend a few minutes talking about this chart and exposing this, and I did this a few minutes ago in, in Dimitri's class, but I'll see if I can repeat this, and Dimitri says if I get this right. So there's a lot about this chart that I like, that I talk about for a long time, um, and so I'll, I'll, I'll go on about this for a few minutes, but there's lots of points to make here. Okay, so let's start on the left. Um, this was a retrofit not a very deep one, um, that was done in Chicago on a hotel. And so a couple things here, you know, you can look at building types. So this was about 1.2 million square feet. Um, the usage was 300 kilowatt hours per square meter per year. I'm shifting units, I apologize. This was done by a company called um, AC, Architectural Energy Corporation. They did the design, they were in Colorado. And you see heating degree days and cooling degree days. So this, this tells you that um, you know, it's basically um, uh, a relatively benign climate with some cooling. If you lived in Chicago, you might not call that benign, but that's okay. Um, and really this is done by component um, improvements. So variable speed chillers, variable speed fans, pumps, more efficient boilers. And you get about, pick a number, 20%. And that's what can be done with moderate retrofits without a lot of risk. That's done today. Okay, here's a building which was a deep retrofit on the Tulane campus. This design was done by a design firm in Stuttgart called Transsolar. And um, here we're getting down to 150 kilowatt hours per square meter per year. And uh, it's in a tropical environment, so we have a lot of cooling going on. And unfortunately, uh, this is getting cut off at the bottom a little bit, so I'll extrapolate. These are very different types of equipment. So, you have radiant ceilings, you have um, the facade of the building is very carefully done, um, shading, you have very efficient lighting, and it's, as we'll see later on in this talk, it's the, the combination of those elements and passive elements that allow the energy reduction to happen. And this is interesting because it's a, 
It's a hot, humid climate. People say, oh, energy efficient buildings don't exist in hot, humid climates. Well, they do. And this works. You can go there. You can, you can go see it, touch it, feel it, live in it. This one's pretty cool. A million square feet in Bonn. Uh, no mechanical ventilation equipment. Um, and 75 kilowatt hours per square meter per year, and it's been there for a while. I don't know. There's a book on it. Um, 2011. It's got to be at least 10 years. By the way, these are the measured use of the projected measures. Measured. Okay, so you know what the name of that building is? this is the uh, Deutsche Post building in Bonn. Um, you can find a lot of this information on the Transolar website. Um, it's, it's a really, I guess I got to explain a little bit of the cartoons up at the top. They're actually not cartoons. It's a CFD picture of wind flow. And when I say there's no mechanical equipment, what basically this building is out pretty much isolated from other buildings. And depending on the prevailing wind directions, there are louvers that open. It's a, it's a, it's a triple facade. And so it puts air into the building and then stack effect moves it throughout. And so you get ventilation in a passive way because of the size of the building and the solar load that actually causes a stack effect to happen. And you use the same stack effect for night cooling or what's known as night purge. It's a massive building in terms of concrete uh, um, construction and so it stores energy. So its time constants are very long. And, but it, it doesn't use mechanical equipment per se. Okay, we can come back to this chart later, but let me, in the interest of time, move on. Uh, so, you know, here's the sort of a, 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 another cartoon. I got a lot of cartoons, but um, if you looked at the energy savings here and you looked at something along market <coughs> penetration, today you've got ESCOs, and they're actually moving pretty aggressively on retrofits, and you have good penetration. But then down at the very high energy efficient buildings, you've got nothing but sort of one-offs. So you get, you get very little market penetration. And this is a sort of standing question. Why is that? Um, there's lots of answers to that, but this is sort of the state of this. And you know, these are buildings. The KFW building is a, is a bank building in Frankfurt. The Debital um, building is in Stuttgart. So these are uh, real buildings that have this kind of performance. OK. So, these are energy efficient buildings. Okay, let's talk a little bit, and I'm shifting gears several times in this that maybe I can recover through Q&A, but um, what are the market conditions here bringing these forward or not? And a little bit of the barriers. Um, so here I'll talk about UTC um, a little bit. We're a moderately sized company um, that is basically split into two pieces. Um, one is on the aerospace side, so Pratt & Whitney, Hamilton, Sunstrand, Sikorsky. Um, uh, enough about the aerospace side. On the commercial side, um, we make uh, fuel cells and, and power generation equipment, uh, carrier air conditioning and heating and refrigeration, uh, both commercial refrigeration as well as transport refrigeration, fire and security, so we make uh, security and, and fire protection equipment, and Otis, which makes elevators. And UTC is the largest capital supplier to the building's market. So we make components. And we like to say that we actually, and we, we, we practice on ourselves, and I'll talk about this a little bit more later. Um, there's really three things. I mean, we, we, we talk about efficiency in our own operations. We actually worry about this for products, and we worry about this for advocacy. So part of the reason I'm here is to talk about energy efficiency and get people interested in this and expose some of the issues. And we've increased the size of the company, and we've decreased energy use and water use over the last 10 years. So it's a bit of an eye chart, but I'll leave this one behind. And at the product level, some of this is actually becoming pretty interesting. Um, and I can't remember all the numbers here, but I'll give you a few. Um, this one I'll talk about a little bit later. This is a combined heating and power system. So these are micro turbines, and this is an absorption chiller. Uh, each one of them is, say, 35% odd efficient in conversion of energy. 
if you recycle the, the heat, the waste heat from the micro turbines into the absorption chiller, you can get well over 90% efficiency. Um, so, uh, turbofan, so you know, we're not talking about buildings right now, but we're talking about products and energy efficiency. Um, the, the gas turbine business is kind of interesting. It's a diversion, um, but historically you'd, you'd really kill for a couple of points, percentage points on specific fuel consumption. Um, this uh, new engine basically decouples the, the fan speed from the, um, from the turbine, so through a gearbox, and you can get upwards of 15% more efficient um, operation. So uh, as a company, uh, we're dealing with more efficient products. Um, and a little bit on advocacy. So this says a little bit about market. So we, pers we um, worked over the last about 2004 through, two, no, 2000, well, it took about three years. And um, there's a report on the web, and I have a few copies if somebody wants one, of a project that was on energy efficient buildings for so-called WBS, WBCSD, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. And this effort was co-chaired by United Technologies and Lafarge with a number of participating companies that looked at what the market is today and what the market transformation needs to be to actually bring energy efficient buildings forward. Now, earlier I showed some technology or some examples, and um, I'll go back to those examples and technology, but I want to show a couple of findings from this report. So, what was done in this study was to create an econometric model and to look at, I think, 20 different regions and then do an extrapolation. And so the, the actual report and what's on the web for the WBCSD looks at um, either total sector energy or CO2 uh, for these different sectors, for example, northeast office space, and then breaks down heating, cooling, ventilation, lighting, and what happens if you incentivize in different ways? It's a bit of a policy study. And every study says basically the same thing. If you incentivize on components, so more efficient boilers, more efficient um, uh, chillers, it, it does nothing. And, the, and the, the growth ultimately is because of the size of the market increasing. So the reason that these actually come up a little bit. As soon as you incentivize on a system metric, energy intensity, kilowatt hours per square meter per year, then things go down. So a lot of the historical policy just doesn't work. See your ratings on individual components. The other thing that the study does, which I don't have a chart for, is, is how much does the cost of energy need to go up? So if you put a carbon price on, basically it's going to have to go up by about three orders of magnitude before it makes a difference. $30 isn't going to do it. At $200, you'll begin to see some movement. You have to go much higher to actually get things to move. Are talking about the size of the carbon tax or? Carbon tax. Well, we have zero carbon tax. Yeah. Carbon. So if you wanted to put it on, what would happen? That's the well, doesn't mean anything. What's it do to the cost of natural gas? Because you said it's going to go up. Right. It, it, but it's, it's roughly the same kinds of charts. If you, put, if you put a policy on carbon tax, what's going to happen? I'd like to ask his question again. How much does electricity have to go up per kilowatt hour before you start to see some differences based on market conditions? I don't have a number. Okay. I can, I can get you one offline, but I, I, what, we, what we did in that study was looked at the, the cost of carbon, putting a direct price on carbon. I can get you a, I try to extra, I, I bring you back an answer to that. Okay. There's another way to, to skin this cat, um, which we know a little bit about because we're in the elevator business. And that is that there's two things on this chart. So um, you take safety for granted in a building. And this is sort of the regulations that you put on and the additional cost of equipment and the inspections. And you roll that basically up for, say, fire safety. And you pay about a 5% first cost premium. So hold that thought for a minute and come over here and you say, okay, what's the payback period on that, that is needed to decrease CO2 emissions? So 
you get about 40%. And um, on a per year basis, order of magnitude, that's about a $75 billion investment. And then on a 10 year payback, 125 billion additional. And 10 year payback are essentially infinite um, is going to cost you um, about 150, 175. So one argument here, 10 year payback is might be stretching it a little bit, but certainly these are beginning to be economically feasible. 10 year payback or infinite payback is, is not. And so the question is, if you took that and the same thing you did with fire safety, you put it on the first cost of the building, it's about 8%. So today's dollars, but this is one way to look at what the market study is. And so either the, the cost has to come or the regulations have to come to bring these kinds of technologies, assuming the technologies are feasible, higher sort of TRL levels, technology readiness levels, that you can bring them to market at an appropriate risk level. That assumes that that's the case, then this lays out the economics. So, you know, what this basically says is, these were the recommendations coming out of the WBCSD study, is that you're, you know, the, the place to really focus attention is, is, is codes. So if you don't tighten up codes and regulations, then you really aren't going to get to energy efficiency um, in a reasonable way. I highlighted controls down here at the bottom because I'll say a little bit about that at the end of this talk. Um, it, you know, here's a, a little bit of a snapshot about what's happening. Um, uh, you have lead. I'll talk a little bit about this at the end. Lead is increasing, but on a base of zero. And there's an additional sort of issue about lead that it's not directly correlated to energy. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. This is a snapshot. Um, it came off of um, the DS Plan Building, which is a design firm in Stuttgart. Uh, so a picture off the wall. And they show energy use intensity. And this actually is beginning to be regulated in Germany and has to be measured on a, a I think, two to five year basis. So this is beginning to see what we're happening in, in the EU that the um, directives and the labeling are coming out. And once the labeling happens, then there's going to be requirements. And China is lagging Europe, and then US is lagging these other two. But there's a labeling effect. And the labeling effect is probably more driven by individual member companies than by Brussels. <coughs> OK, now, um, probably don't want to dwell on this, but sort of get to this. Um, These low energy buildings, um, so this picture at the bottom, this little thumbnail I put at the bottom right, um, uh, a number of, uh, number of people associated with UTC, we, we did a, a survey of these low energy buildings and this report is available. We didn't hold it proprietary, so I gave a copy to Dimitri, but I can certainly give copies to whoever wants it. And um, we did a tour, we started in Frankfurt and worked our way through to Zurich. And this sort of summarizes that that there's much more at play here than just energy. And there's a lot to say about this kind of chart. But um, these buildings were built <clears throat> primarily as demonstration efforts to look at not only energy, but the maintenance of these buildings, the complexity of these buildings. And let me come back to this charter to say, say this in, in the context of this. But I put this in the overall flow because there's a lot more going on here than just energy. And I should probably mention this now, and I'll mention it, I think, on my last chart, that in the US, the operating expense of buildings is roughly 6% of the total for energy. This is, energy is the 6% piece. And so energy doesn't dominate today um, buildings. Now, it may in the future, but when we talk about energy efficient buildings in the market movement, that's a really low number begs the question, which at least is rhetorical, I guess, for right now, so I can get through the rest of this talk, what does matter? So what are the other sort of 94% figure? OK, <laughs> let's talk about what's hard, and then talk a little bit about R&D, and then I'll take some questions. OK, so um, here's another slide of uh, a UTC product, but you know, lots of people produce these now, combined heat and power. So you're using waste heat. 
and you can bump up the efficiency. Now, one way of, of thinking about this, which is kind of interesting from sort of a technology perspective, is where is the benefit coming from? And this is a very parochial discussion because I'm a controls person, but it's coming from the valve and it's coming from the embedded system that's regulating the valve here. It's not coming from the individual microturbines or the absorption chiller. It's coming from control. And all you're doing is using the waste heat, but you're throttling how much waste heat you actually supply to provide heating, cooling through the absorption chiller and electric power. So you've, you've migrated to sort of more of an IT basis for where the delivery of the performance is actually coming from. But it's typically hidden. Okay. Um, what about payback? So that's a little bit of a comment. This is a little bit of a shift. Uh, this is a, a elevator uh, final assembly plant in Tianjin, um, the Tianjin Economic Recovery uh, Zone. Um, and we practiced on ourselves. I said earlier. So these are a couple of UTC examples. Um, we entered late in the design process. We were still able to get 25% reduction, 7% um, incremental cost in a payback period of somewhere between two and a half and four and a half years. So what this basically did was to um, modify and use some natural ventilation and then to optimally size the individual equipment. There's a lot more runway here that you can get, and that's where you can jack this number up. Um, and you can, you can get a lot higher. And this was done by evaluating lots and lots of options that weren't additive, but they're coupled. OK, so, okay. so let's get to what's hard, and then maybe some fixes. So I said earlier that lead doesn't necessarily apply. So um, this is the. The, the classic now from a couple of years ago, uh, lead chart on proposed savings, design intent versus measured savings. And yes, it's a scatter plot. And there's lots of reasons it's a scatter plot. Um, but in terms of the snapshot of where lead buildings are applied, gold, silver, platinum, it doesn't necessarily correlate to energy savings. Now, there's lots of reasons for this. The, the, the new lead standards are different than this, so I'm not really attacking lead per se, but it gave points for things that weren't necessarily energy related, and it gave points for modeling the energy performance, not measuring the energy performance. And so when you measure energy performance, you're getting some over predictions. Um, this came out of a study, which I'll mention in a couple charts, uh, more from NREL that was published in 2008, where there were significant gaps in design intent versus measured performance. And um, the point of this chart is just that there's large variability today. So bringing these high energy buildings forward is not easy. If you go and look at this, um, this study from NREL, so uh, this is this lessons learned from case studies of six high performance buildings that was published in 2008, I think it was. Um, you know, here's an example of a miss. So the design intent was 66%. Measured was 44%. So we're not talking about a couple of percent misses. We're talking about major misses. Um, the KFW building, which was built as a demonstrator in Germany, um, was designed to be under 100 kilowatt hours per square meter per year. And it took three years of tuning to bring it into performance. So, so either you're having a miss. Or you can eventually get there, but it takes a long time. These are hard to deliver. And so from a market perspective, the, the point is, um, how much risk do you actually take on? Now, there's a question sort of why, why is this occurring? Well, you know, this one we can deal with right here. Um, so this building, this is the wrong picture. And maybe I have it on the chart in a minute. It has an open louver on the top of the building. And it uses stack effect to basically bring and naturally ventilate the building. And it has a large number of louvers. So it's not just one. It's a large number. And so it brings the building through. And what it basically is conditioned on is getting night purge. So you want cooling at night. It's a massive building. So you want to cool down the concrete. And then it has thermal storage. And so the trickiness here, this is, uh, there is a report that's cited in that other report that I, that I mentioned that, that I can give you. But it's also 
you know, KFW is doing this as a demonstrator, so they're being very public about it. It was very difficult to set the neutral buoyancy point of where the, the purge would occur. And ultimately, the way this was done was to have a very detailed model of the building and then use the model to set the, the, the neutral buoyancy point. But um, that required very intensive modeling and skill sets. Okay, so here's a cartoon that I like that basically says more or less where you lose energy in buildings today in the design process or the development process. So you have three basic barriers, if you will. One is at design. So your biggest leverage is in the layout of the building, the, the, the location, the facade, the building envelope. And that's your biggest lever. And today, it's not easy to use design tools. There's a scalability issue. So these firms I talked about in Stuttgart, they're very good. They're essentially boutique firms. They're not things that can roll this out on a, a huge scalability uh, way. When you construct the building, you have a matter of robustness. Do you know the sensitivities? Do you know how to control the contractors? Do you know how to design the supervisory control? Do you know how commissioning should work? And then finally, when you go down into operations, it's a productivity issue. The quality of your facility maintenance, can you keep the building operating as the design intent? So there's three basic places. There's a number of barriers, and there's a number of specific places where you lose energy that can be attacked. And up at the top, there's basically handoffs, where the architect and design firm then throws the design over the wall, literally, sometimes to the contractors and they throw it over the wall to the maintenance issues or maintenance people. And the lessons learned and the concept of operations are not carried through. So you have some big gaps. I don't know if I put it here at the end. Okay, so I, I put it at the end. I'll say a little bit more about those gaps. So here's basically how you can get 80% savings. Um, if you worry about the architecture in the envelope, you worry about the thermal system, the ventilation system, and then the occupancy and utility rates or, or using the energy more effectively, you have a staircase that allows you to step up. And this is a cartoon, but you some ways have a technology risk. And arguably, these might move over a little bit depending on your skill. And so this also matters where you actually enter the design process. If you're doing a retrofit versus new construction, you have more or less design freedom in how you approach this problem. Um, and the contrast is that these other buildings were designed, in some sense this is in the section on markets, or uh, sorry, what's hard, is that, and I alluded to this earlier, you have, um, A difference in design philosophy, and it, it's, a, it's a matter of sort of debate um, how, how old this has been known, but you have sort of, in the United States, you could argue climate insensitive designs versus climate responsive designs, okay? So it, today, in most buildings in the United States, you expect that when you turn your thermostat, it happens more or less instantly that you either get a heating or cooling. And you, you've, from a controls perspective, you overactuated your building. Um, if you have climate responsive designs, then you're tuning your dynamics of the building to adapt to the climate. So the way in which the wind flows and the louvers open allow you to naturally ventilate the Deutsche Post building. And the way in which the prevailing wind pattern and the, the solar pattern work allow you to actually have night purge or passively ventilate and heat and cool your building. And the controls can be made very simple by decoupling the system. Today, everything is coupled. You, you uh, dehumidify your air by cooling it and then heating it. Um, and then, this is the same chart here. Monitoring and tuning is, is, again, a matter of understanding the dynamics of the building. So you have these three aspects of design, construction, and operations. And if you, if you shift your perspective to more of a um, design of dynamics, rather than overpowering the natural dynamics with um, HVAC systems that are used today, this is where the source of the energy savings basically comes from. Now, um, I work for a company that actually makes a lot of that equipment that is overactuated in some sense. Um, 
And from an economic perspective, you can say, well, you know, the Deutsche Post building uses no mechanical equipment per se. That's not quite true. And, you know, standing question is, but I think the answer is more or less obvious, but the details are kind of interesting. There is mechanical equipment in these buildings. It's just not the equipment that's used today. And a couple charts. So this is the earth, wind, and fire chart. So um, you're actually using very different equipment than you have today. And I think the next chart, I, yeah, so this is a better chart I have. So today, for example, let's look at the bottom piece of this. If you're using fans for ventilation as opposed to a natural stack effect, this is where you're getting your energy savings. But the natural effect requires that you be climate sensitive and that you design your dynamics of your building appropriately. So you're shifting your burden away from one size fits all to where you have to, have to tailor the dynamics of the building. Now there's another way to view this chart that instead of sort of creating heating and cooling like a vapor compression system does, most of the equipment on the right hand side moves heat around. It's very different in terms of efficiency creating energy versus moving it around. Okay, now go back to, you know, other countries and how they're dealing with this. So um, one of the things we found when we went through Europe a little bit, so this is a snapshot, and I'm not sure how much of this should be extrapolated, but it's interesting, is that um, from an ecosystem point of view, both regulatory, technology, delivery process, the overall system was smoothed out. So the, the, the handoffs were bridged by having the design firm track through the design all the way through. And the business models supported this. So in some sense, there was a business model that helped out at design, but also allowed them to intervene through construction and then operations. And these handoffs were actually very well managed, and they're beginning to be managed in both a regulatory process as well as the, the system, if you will, to play on the sort of title of this talk, in terms of the, the maintenance, the construction, the design, and then going past the design in terms of academia. So in Europe, almost every architectural department has a building physics department associated with it. So you have this chain that actually is connected. Okay, a couple words about R&D, and I've gone over my time. Um, so a couple of reports that I mentioned, um, we pushed out one. Uh, we had a workshop um, on uh, uh, the use of high-performance computing for building design. Um, it's dated January 2011. The, the workshop was last year. That one I can send out. It'll be posted on a website soon. Um, and then this other report from 2009 that talked about the European low-energy buildings. And so I'll, I'll mention a couple of the findings from this. Um, from a technology point of view and perhaps from a controls point of view, you know, the problem here is, or the, not problem, the, the interesting issue is that historically the way you overactuate buildings is you actually separate length and time scales. And with these low energy buildings, you're beginning to collapse them, which changes how you actually uh, need to approach design. Um, uh, you know, com complexity has this feature. You have, you have a large scale problem, you have a large number of components, you have mathematically different kinds of structures, and you have very different length and time scales. So this is sort of a working definition of complexity. And there's a couple of different features that then go into this. So um, there is a lack of tools available for tracking uncertainty, and particularly for dynamic systems. So if you have a design, but then you want to build it, you know, this goes back to sort of ideas of Six Sigma, which were brought forward in sort of the electronics and the automotive area. You actually want to uh, track the uncertainty and be able to control the mean and the variance. Um, that really can't be done easily for these kinds of buildings. So you either get modes that can shift dramatically during operation. So these are radiant um, uh, or under, uh, um, these are buoyant flows for ventilation under uh, underfloor air treatment, or just in terms of the controlling parameters in the building. Um, this is where you fail that first handoff. You think you have design intent, 
You go to build it, you don't know what your sensitivities are. This is almost always what happened in those NREL studies is that you didn't know what you had to control. Uh, controls obviously needs to change. This is a eye chart and I'm not gonna get into it in detail, but today controls are uh, fixed interfaces and they don't allow for interplay between the dynamics. When you allow the interplay between the dynamics and ultimately you design the dynamics of the building, you get a staircase effect of increasing your energy efficiency. Um, this came out of a study um, that I'll mention in the last slide, but energy efficiency studies that we did um, on the University of California Merced campus, we did some case studies of, of loosening up the dynamics through controls. Then I talked about diagnostics a little bit, so I'll go through this. Uh, software is an issue, we can go through that later. Computational issues and bringing HPC to bear is an issue. Um, commercialization paths are an issue. I wanna mention one thing at the end, Merced, I know I'm skipping through this. So, the final chart, I wanna go back to my 6% number. Um, so, you know, there's a, there's a cartoon here. There's a, there's a notion about cost. So how much does it cost the industry or how much cost savings do you basically get? So the level of interoperability, coordination, tool integration. And then there's a level of energy and carbon reduction. And the question is, you wanna go in the upper uh, right-hand corner. You want low cost and you want high energy savings. Today, I, I would argue that it's very hard to go directly up, but if you worry about things like diagnostics and you worry about where that other big chunk of money is, and the big driver is operations and maintenance costs in buildings today, if you can reduce that, then you allow yourself to have a path to go up in a different way. So that's it, back to key points, I went Five minutes over, and I'm done. Questions, please. Yeah. I'll bring up the question we asked earlier. Given that uh, you're not optimistic about the price of energy being high enough to create this kind of efficiency, what would it take? How much, how much would, would energy have to go up before you don't have all the regulations? To do the, job. Uh, the rough estimate, and I don't have a good, you know, I didn't give you a number. The rough estimate on the price of energy is 5x. We, we know it's not 4x <laughs> because if you look at the difference in the energy price in South Carolina and California, it's 4x for many users, and we haven't seen that effect. So at 4x, it doesn't happen. So it could be more than 5x. It could be more than 5x. Probably much more. I mean, energy, it's not only the, it's the cost, but it's the relative cost to what people are going to invest. I mean, the places where you do see people paying attention to energy is where it really does become much more than 6%. So when I said that number, and I'm tossing out a lot here in this, this discussion today, if you looked at the cost of energy for these big box stores, they're investing in energy efficiency because there it matters a great deal and every percent savings they get goes directly to their bottom line. Is that 6% of the building operating cost or of the total budget for the business that occupies the building? No, the operating cost of the building. Okay. That was a I can get you the reference on it. That was a public DOE study that was done several years ago. So my number is a bit dated, but nothing's really changed in the interim. So the big hump there is the uh, mortgage payment, basically. And the operations cost, no, the big, big hunk is, is the labor involved in facility maintenance. Have you looked at the uh, impact of the age, the, the fleet of buildings? So if you're working in a city like New York, versus a city, a, a newer city like Phoenix. Is, if, if you're an ESCO or if you're a contractor or a, or a retrofit, do you want to go right after the, the newer fleets or, or is there any, or, or, or are you doomed if you, if you look at older buildings or do you want to just focus on buildings built after a certain city? Um, it's sort of work in progress. I mean, it's a good question. I don't have a simple answer. Um, uh, yeah, the best I can say is it's none of the above and all of the above. Um, we're looking at that 
in some ways, is a follow-up to World Business Council study and sort of a number of contracts that um, that we're actively working on. Um, you know, in some ways, the older stock actually is is easier because there's more thermal mass to work on, um, and so it, it varies. The what what I think you know one thing in your in your question that needs to be brought up is that to actually achieve energy savings, and the reason I wrote 50% here and not the savings that I showed on these newer construction buildings is the only thing you really have to do, or the, the biggest lever is, is retrofits. And so um, you, you've got to address the retrofit market and you've got to do it efficiently. And so today ESCOs really operate at the 20% sort of level because that's the risk and the, the, the return on investment that people are comfortable with you know, the same discussion we had about energy costs, you've got to raise that up and you've got to enable tools that they can take higher risk and their uh, return on investment for the business has to be higher. But that didn't really address your question. It's a different sort of issue. It's, uh, that, that, that's, a, that's definitely, as far as I know, it's a work in progress for the commercial market as a whole, for GSA and for DOD. They're all three looking at the, exactly that question. In your early slides, you showed that in industrial buildings, lighting was the biggest contributor to energy consumption, while in homes it was HVAC. Uh, why the difference? Um, this. So here you have lights, and here you have lights. Look at this room. I think this is sort of the example. Look at your house. You have a couple of desk lamps on here. You have banks and banks of fluorescents. Can you transfer any of the lessons learned in the commercial sector to the residential sector? I personally don't know. That it could, or one of the buildings that took three or four years to actually tune the, the control systems. Is that normal for one of these high efficiency buildings with, with controls in them? I think what's normal is they don't get tuned at all. No, they don't get tuned at all. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not being funny. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, LBNL did a study years ago, not too many years ago, but several years ago that buildings uh, almost instantly detune as soon as they're constructed. Damper stick, uh, lights go out, um, control systems get turned off. Um, I, mean, I should be a little careful about sort of what I say when I'm being recorded. Um, there was an example high energy building in a different country that I visited and the control system was so complicated they just turned it off. It wasn't a matter of tuning it, it just, they turned it off. That's anecdotal, but I, I, I mean, there's enough data out there, particularly LBNL is worried about commissioning for some years. You can actually go look at the data. And, you know, under the bucket of commissioning is tuning the controller. And tuning controllers for buildings is a, is a um, there, I mean, the reason this is the case is actually interesting too. Um, the, there's a lot more I could say about this, but the, the Every building should be commissioned. Not every building needs to be designed. So if you look at the cost structure of where people spend money, they have to commission buildings in some sense. And so a lot of people cut back on that savings. And so when I say buildings don't have to be designed, think about Walmarts or think about Walgreens. They're all basically the same, right? So you do that once and you can roll that out. But every building needs to be commissioned. And so if you cut that back, you end up not tuning the controller. Uh, comparable to the uh, German post office in the U.S. and uh, which building is it, and is it successful? What's it like for people working in it? And also, how well do you have to know the future climate in the city you're going to build this building if it's passively heated, and cooled, ventilated? A lot of questions. Pick, pick whatever you I don't know a single building in the United States that looks like the Deutsche Post building personally. Manitoba Hydro, 
up in Manitoba is actually more aggressive than the um, Deutsche Post building in a more aggressive climate, and it performs better. So that's a North American building. Um, so there are these buildings. Um, I've been in several of them. I, I don't. I mean, I've, I've visited them. They're 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 comfortable. They're functional, and once they're tuned, because the dynamics are adjusted, they are very stable. Unlike the detuning of systems that are actively actuated, these buildings once they're tuned. Now, your point about what happens if people build around it or things like that—that that is an issue. That hasn't been completely tested, and then there are other issues. So a lot of these use geothermal. What's the longevity of geothermal? People don't actually know. There's some history in the United States where there's been issues with geothermal and they lose the boreholes. There's a question that all these buildings actually have constructed uh, serpentine loops inside the concrete slabs. They don't know what the longevity of those are. So there are, there are risks in how these buildings are brought to market. I've exaggerated something in the way I've told the story. But if you look at the overall life cycle cost, there are definitely issues here that have to be resolved. But going back to the first question you asked, I don't know of a single building. Now, somebody may tell me there's one, and I'll, I'll see it. But I've, I've looked at this pretty carefully. And I, um, you could argue that the one in Tulane is actually similar. And there's a similar building on the Loyola campus near um, outside of Chicago. They don't quite get to the aggressiveness and the size and the scale of the Deutsche Post one, though. Is your is your company also uh, doing the same KPIs on and and, and uh, studies on water? Not as much. And why is that? I don't know. That should be the right answer. Um, it's also really our market presence. So energy is a market driver. Energy isn't something we've focused on. I mean, there is a follow-on study that we participate in for the World Business Council that looks at um, more urban landscapes and water, and we participate in that. But this was the first study, and you're right, there needs to be another one, and water needs to be considered, and yes, we'll participate in this. Um, I should have, this is where we're at. I'm trying to make sure I understood that concept of the 4X and the 5X. And I look at this slide, it says commercial annual energy bill, $120 billion. It, it Was that statement that that number would have to go to four or five times that level? You know that, I, I, so I, I actually didn't participate in that, so I'm quoting off memory. But the, what I, when I answered the question that was earlier, what would, what would, you know, to make these kinds of charts move, have to actually see owners of these different market segments actually um, see an increase in price at that level. In order to incur the capital cost to drive the CO2 levels down to a target, the zero, the zero, what is that, the zero energy bill? So you have to have something happening in concert. You either have to have cost of energy increase or you have to have regulatory pressures because you believe something else is happening. Either you believe that global warming is happening or energy security is happening. You have to take some position. Now, there's lots that of trade-offs. That seems like an amazing number to me that to get to a zero energy building, you'd need to go to 5x energy costs. Energy today does not, does not cost. It's too cheap, way too cheap. Too cheap to move this. going on. Most um, buildings, when you look at what does the payback have to be to get 50% penetration, you need a payback 100 a year. So your normal instinctive thing is you look at compact fluorescence in California, they have a four-month payback, and you go around, you count bolts, and you go, okay, what percentage of the bolts have switched over as a result of the four-month payback? You get very low penetration. So our normal instinct from Economics 101, that as soon as something has a two or three year payback, everyone will go and implement it. It turns out that in the real world, for a lot of complex reasons, that doesn't happen. So prices have to get really high to get to 70, 80, 90% penetration. As a, as, a footnote, as a footnote, though, this is not an answer to your question. But you know, 
the, the, the system affects matter. This is you know, a parochial discussion up at the front of the room, but um, there was a side discussion in the World Business Council study. Um, I'm, I'm probably uh, ad-libbing a little bit here, but I can get the details. Um, there was a pretty uh, big study in France where they rolled out that they were going to save energy on using compact fluorescent bulbs. And so they, they disperse them, and uh, they use more electricity. Electricity in France is generated mostly by nuclear energy, and so heating actually is done through electric. And so they had to replace the 100-watt bulbs, which supplied both heat and light, by more electric heating. And so not only is it a cost issue, but it really is a system issue about how the policies need to be tied together. As soon as you incentivize energy use intensity, some of those things in the market take care of themselves. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.